we're starting a series, a topical series, that's been in the, some ways the back of my mind for a long time. But kind of last minute, after we finished Acts last week, I said, sure, we'll do that now. And uh, I was thinking about this, I can't believe, but uh, I was likely starting to preach here 10 years ago this month, June, June or July. And uh, one of the first preaching series I did here was actually I called The Shelter. And I talked about the community of Christ and how that looks. And I guess this is like another one of those series where I wanted to examine. And I'm calling it Christ in Community and also Christian Community. <laughs> and um, how, what does the Bible say about the church operating, the community of Christ? And for this first message, it's really derived... From a very wordy verse in 1 Peter 2.9. And uh, because it's wordy, I, I want to hit you with the summary phrase that I think will best call to your mind what I feel Peter and the Holy Spirit are, are getting at here. And by way of example, the old rabbis usually, uh, Jewish rabbis, would usually bookmark memorable passages of scripture by beginning whatever passage they call to mind. So, for example, you think about Jesus on the cross, what does he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And his hearers were, he was likely trying to urge his hearers, not only with maybe what he felt, but with what David wrote in all of Psalm 22. As those are the beginning words of Psalm 22, a, a messianic psalm. In the same way, I think everything that I'll be saying today can be distilled down to these five words. Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? The Christian community, by way of, of Peter's words in our passage, today can be reflected, demonstrated, exemplified by that statement, can I pray for you? So, I invite you to stand in honor of hearing the word of the Lord if you're able. 1 Peter 2.9 Let's read that passage and then unpack it together. We read, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's pray. Father, as we look at this statement that you inspired the Apostle Peter to write for us, we trust, Holy Spirit, that you who wrote it and inspired it are, is still present today. So take what you said and give us our daily bread with it, that we might feast upon your word and grow in it, to be strengthened and nourished by it. As we unpack this statement, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would be our guide, that you would translate to us the things you want us to take away. And Father, if we take away anything, may we learn to use the phrase and use it often to those we encounter, can I pray for you? Father, we love you and we thank you. We ask that you would be the one speaking and not I. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I, I see in this passage Peter identify what the community of Christ looks like. And I really see six identifiers. And I know you're going to hear six, and you're going to like, that's a lot. Just remember, can I pray for you? And some of you are saying that right now to me. <laughs> but the six identifiers are, is that you're chosen, we're priests, we're a set-apart nation, we're his, for preachers, and lastly, light bearers. Those are the six things I see in this passage. And Peter starts by saying that you, the Christians, are a chosen race. By virtue of being a Christian, we become a chosen race. And this race is made up of many smaller communities or identities, if you want to say it that way. I'm reminded of what... Uh, John the Evangelist envisions in Revelation where he writes that when it comes to us, the church, he says there was a vast multitude from every nation, 
tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were robed in white with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. In Christ, all communities are invited to be a part of his community. And all communities, they believe in Christ, are part of the chosen race. In 1 Peter 2.9, the word for chosen is electon, or elect, where we get that term elect. I won't go into the theological names behind the views surrounding elect. I'll only rather look at this verse in context. And what does verse 7 say? That there is an honor for the believing, but not for the unbelieving. That seems to be a line of, of demarcation. If one believes, they can expect this. But for those who don't believe, they can expect that. And that's kind of what John, the, the evangelist John, is all about whenever he records for us Jesus' words. Over and over we hear in the Gospel of John, whoever believes, whoever believes. So, one becomes chosen then by virtue of putting their faith, their trust, allegiance into Christ by belief. For those who believe in Christ and make him their king, we become chosen. You know, in America politics, it seems much, so more, much more so today, but I only speak that from my brief existence of 30-something years, but that when a president gets elected... The effects of the platform of that party they're a part of are felt much more fully. Especially last election, it didn't seem like we were putting one man, one man was elected president, but the party and the platform visibly came into a ruling position and suddenly the Democratic parties became the leaders of the nations. And the same can be said for 2016 and Trump and the Republicans. And so for the voters who pledged themselves to specific parties... It's like when your leader is elected, you get the benefits. If you're a Republican, when a Republican gets elected, your party wins. Your platform begins taking hold. So in essence, you go to the White House. Your ideas, ideals, policies, platforms, interests head to the proverbial throne. Christ shows up and says, believe in me, you will be saved. And so when we believe in him, when we put our trust in him... He's the one chosen by God. We'll talk about that in a minute. And if he's chosen, we're chosen in him. We're saved because of his position. John says it, Jesus says it this way, I should say, in John chapter 6. He says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. So in this we hear of Christ's origin from heaven. We hear of his position. He is an ambassador of the Father. He's not here on his own reconnaissance. But he's here on the mission or the will of him who sent me. So you could say that he's been chosen. He's been elected to do the will of someone else. His Father. Well, what's the mill? What, what's the will? What is the mission? Verse 39 this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. So now the information is expanding. His mission is to lose none of those he, God the Father, has given to him, Christ. Rather, that he should raise them up on the last day. Well, now we might have questions. Who are those the Father has given to Jesus? How were they selected? Jesus explains that as well. Verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Did you hear the answer of those, of who are those the Father has given Jesus? How were they were selected? Whoever sees the Son and believes in Him. We are a chosen race. Christ is chosen by God for a mission and purpose. And for all those stretching across all tribes, communities, 
languages, nations, ages. For all those who see Christ and believe in him, when they put their faith and trust in Christ, they become chosen. Does that make sense? You're like, not really, but continue. No, I'm kidding. I do believe you are hearing that. Peter also says uh, this about us, that we, the people of God, the community of Christ, are a royal priesthood. Now we're going to see this more and more as we unpack each phrase, but these are all really designations and titles and offices that God specifically had for Israel that God, through Peter, is now applying to the church, the chosen people of God. And I believe it's because God has always had Gentiles, those are non-Jews, he always had non-Jews and Jews in mind for his holy people. It's why he didn't bat an eye when Gentiles like Rahab or Ruth joined into the ranks of Israel in the Old Testament. But it's just more blatantly evident and kind of a big deal in the New Testament. After Christ ascends and more Gentiles and larger numbers are flocking to God. And as a priesthood, we are in some ways the connection for the world to God. Lower case mediators, and I use that term hesitantly, because... We're obviously not taking a job reserved only for Christ, as Paul says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, a man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. Yet, for this royal priesthood, us, if you look at the text in context, Peter says earlier in the chapter, You yourselves are being built into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable uh, to God through Jesus Christ. Again, it seems evident that Peter is taking from the Old Testament imagery surrounding Israel. And for example, in Exodus 19, 5 through 6, what does God say to Moses He says, now, if you will listen to me and carefully keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although all the earth is mine, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. And what this is in Exodus is a fulfillment of the many promises to made to Abraham in places like Genesis 12, 3, 18.18, 22.18, God says all the what? Nations, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through Abraham and his seed. And in Christ, Galatians 3.29 says, that the scriptures were pointing to a seed singular. One particular offspring, the one we're chosen in. The one we're elected. The entire world is blessed through the holy nation, the kingdom of priests. Does that make sense? Yes. And just as worshipers came to the priest in the Old Testament and and through sacrifices received blessings from God, so we are now a kingdom of priests on the move, outgoing. And through the spiritual sacrifices, the nations are continually blessed. Now, how is that, you might ask? Christian, if you're not praying for the unsaved, if you're not praying for the peace and welfare of our nations, if you're not praying for the protection and righteousness and continuation of people in power who are righteous, who is? If it's not God's sons and daughters beseeching his throne for the healing of our land, who is? After this verse, Peter, I think, goes into a general description of what a royal priesthood looks like, what spiritual worship and spiritual sacrifices look like. He says, dear friends, I urge you as strangers and temporary residents to abstain from fleshly desires that war against you. Right? That's what an unholy priesthood does, self-indulgence. However, verse 12, conduct yourselves 
honorably among the Gentiles. Now Peter is likely using the word Gentiles figuratively here. We should be honorable among non-believers so that in a case where they speak against you as those who do evil, they may, by observing your good works, glorify God in a day of visitation. Submit to every human institution because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For it is God's will that you, by doing good, silence the ignorance of foolish person, people. As God's slaves, live as free people, but don't use your freedom as a way to conceal evil. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Now, I, I see this as a general picture. I mean, I think we have enough lists in the Bible if you want to get out a pen and paper and keep lists. But I feel like Peter is saying being a royal priesthood means fearing God, being nice, loving people, doing good. We're lowercase mediators in that we are God's ambassadors on the earth. When people want to know who God is, we should reflect him as a community. We are chosen by God and we are his royal priesthood. We are also a holy nation, says Peter. What does holy mean? Set apart. We're a set apart nation. There are nations and kingdoms of the earth, but we are a part of the set apart one uh, in a category by itself. I've done a lot of word studying before on this idea of holy or holiness. And for me, it feels like more often than not in the scriptures, we can define holiness or being holy by learning more about what it's not. <laughs> and so in this way, it becomes more of a silhouette description. The thing itself is black and mysterious, but we make out the shape of when we see what it isn't. For instance... To keep the Old Testament references going, the biggest thing we can see about what a holy nation is might show up in 1 Samuel 8 in my mind where Israel rejects their king. They show up to their prophet, their judge Samuel, and they say to him, appoint a king to judge us the same as all the other nations have. Or in verses 19 and 20 when they flesh out their reasoning, we must have a king over us. And then we'll be like all the other nations. Our king will judge us. Go out before us and fight our battles. And what the, when what the Lord tells Samuel is this. But the Lord told him, listen to the people and everything they say to you. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me as their king. They are doing the same thing to you that they have done to me since the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, abandoning me and worshiping other gods. The greater context uh, of Samuel suggests that out of fear, the Israelites wanted a king. Verse 5 in this chapter actually the blame the, actually gives us the blame that Samuel's sons aren't righteous. So they're saying, well, they're not going to be good leaders, so we want a king. And then in 1 Samuel 12, Samuel reports it's because they feared a certain enemy that they wanted a physical, tangible king and a standing army against the threat. Up to that point, they had to rely on blind faith that God would, would answer them when they prayed and he would rise up defenders depending on their righteousness. So holiness would have looked like not demanding a king. Holiness would have looked like trusting God, even when a foreign enemy comes to attack. Instead of pushing the leadership that God has in place around, hey, we had it with you. We don't want a prophet and priest praying that out of nowhere God's going to defend us. No, if we operated our kingdom like everyone else does on the face of the planet, with kings and, and leaders and standing armies, we wouldn't be so afraid, right? You and I are part of a holy nation. We don't need physical, visible, tangible symbols, signs, or people in leadership. There needs to be no immediate substitution or representative standing in the way of Jesus. He is our risen Lord and Savior. Right in the faith and practice of the yearly meeting, I'm personally glad it, it says under our doctrine on the church, 
Its head is Jesus Christ, who serves immediately as priest and ministers directly as teacher and prophet. To be part of a holy nation means not to look like the rest of the world. Some nations have presidents, some have prime ministers, some have kings, some tribes have chiefs, some religious organizations have spiritual high offices, but the holy nation of the kingdom of God doesn't look like the rest of the world. You can call the president, might take a while, or write a letter, but we pray immediately to our leader, though he can't reach by, be by phone or email. He can be reached through the mind, which is a lot quicker. You can bet the president or any leader of any nation or organized church sleeps at times, or is capable of sin, or can't attend to every need. But our holy nation knows a sovereign who is ever present, never sleeps, is entirely pure. We're a holy nation, a set-apart nation. It's different, it's unique, it's in our midst, says Jesus. It's everlasting, it's transcendent and pervasive through all, all nations. Our government doesn't have a central capital, rather it's existing right now on earth as it is in heaven. A holy nation. So let's regroup. We're chosen, we're a priesthood of, of believers, his ambassadors, we're a set-apart nation, and we are his, says Peter, a people for his possession. Have you ever heard the phrase that we are, the Bible says, the Christians are a peculiar place, people? That's actually the phrase right here. The HCSB has a people for his possession. But the King James says a peculiar people. And you might say that sounds like two different things. It's really not. When you're dealing with the King James, you are dealing with a Bible that first came out in 1611, and most versions accessible were last updated in 1789. And peculiar usually brings to my mind things that are odd, strange, different, or unique. But if you look up the word history of that word peculiar, English words change meanings over time, the Latin roots of peculiar is actually livestock related. <laughs> Peculiaris, which means privately owned. What is peculiar to me, excuse the pun, is that even this week I brought this up, this passage, to some friends, and I heard people tell me that their pastor has given them teachings from this scripture, 1 Peter 2 9, and stressed the idea of peculiar as we know it today. Christians will look odd, different, unique, peculiar. Now, Christians may indeed look funny, different, unique, countercultural, and I've made some of those comments myself in preaching. But that's not what this passage, 1 Peter 2 9, is first and foremost getting at. I don't believe God calls us to be weird or different for weird or different sakes. <laughs> God calls us to be first, fundamentally, and decisively His. That's the point. The identity shared in Christ's community is being of His possession. We're not unique because God calls us to be unique. We're unique because we're God's. Period. We're privately owned by God. Now, there are some worldly leaders that would like you to believe that whether outright or through actions and policies, that you belong to them. <laughs> Paul says we were bought at a price referring to Christ's sacrifice. We're doubly gods. Christy and I have two, ki two kids, and from the objective point of view, I can tell you we made them. And I can't even tell you how much money we've invested in them now, from clothes to food to beds to toys to hospital visits to medicine. Regardless of the fact of the simple sanctity and dignity afforded by human life and the kind of love and value and connection that that brings, we're invested and in many ways we claim them as our own, right? Christ claims us at his, as his own. He is the real, genuine, true creators of Calvin and Landon and everybody else and of his people, all people. But for those who believe in him and ju thus join the community of Christ, they're professing the fact that he not only created us, but he died for us. And he paid for us with his life. The greatest payment anyone could ever give. No one has greater love than this, that, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. So let alone he creating us 
He died for us, and I think he has rights to call us his. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Does that settle? You hear it all the time, but I don't know if it settles with me. I'll buy things. I'll, I'll do things. That suggests that I seem to think I own myself. My actions and my purchases are solely my choices, and no one should have a say over those things. But to be in Christ suggests otherwise. To be in Christ suggests like like Christ, we should come to adopt the point of view that says, I only do what my Father tells me. You and I are His. Well, there have been a few action adjectives on who we are. We've been mostly identified, but what is our commission? We're part of a holy nation that does things, that has a commission. We're chosen to be priests. Connections and ambassadors for a non-believing world to their creator and we are his own possession so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light preachers we're all preachers now let me define preachers i don't mean that we all do what i do up here only we do it in the neighborhoods and private rooms or the restaurant let me say it this way this phrase is not out of a vacuum Right, The stuff before it is necessary. If we're chosen in Christ by virtue of truly believing, trusting in him, if we're offering spiritual sacrifices as a royal priesthood, and if we're identifying with the set-apart nation while living as exiles in other worldly nations, and if we identify with not being our own, not owning our own bodies, but being his own possession then all these identifying marks will naturally lead into preaching about him. Uh, You know, it occurred to me today that this um, example I'm about to give is kind of Father's Day related. But I remember this day. Two of my nephews, Zach and Austin. Zach was, was born a week before Christy and I got married in 2012. And then Austin was born probably about two years later in 2014. Then in 2016, Calvin comes, and then it was probably 2018, 2019, maybe even 2020, when when Calvin is playing age with Zach and Austin, something was said that amused me. Zach had never really talked to me by name. He never called me Kevin. He never called me Uncle Kevin. He might talk back if I said hi. But when my son Calvin was playing age, he finally called me something. Calvin's dad. (laughs) And it made me laugh because I had known Zachary longer than either he or I knew my son. But it was funny to me that the only name he ever called me up to that point was Calvin's dad. My relationship to my son identified me for him. Your relationship to your father should. And if you're living into this identity as the community of Christ, that should identify you to the world. You're a Christian, you're God's son, God's daughter, you're part of that holy nation, right? And this identity, this community will mean something, and eventually will and should come out of you, right? As Christ says, essentially, we bear the fruit from the tree we're naturally a part of. I mean, it's pretty obvious what kind of tribe or community or identity some people are in this world. We, we, we know them and they'll see Certain people identifying themselves. Sometimes it's the way they carry themselves. Other times it's in your face and they want you to know it. But if you're chosen of God, a royal priesthood, interceding for the world to God, part of a a set-apart nation, showing allegiance to God, if you're His, you'll be preaching with word and deed. You want to know one of the easiest ways to evangelize? If you want to use that word, sometimes run from that word like it's the devil without being imposing or thought weird or rejected? I'll give you a hint. It's only five words. I've already told you them. And it works in most cases, but especially in cases if you're in a conversation where where someone is maybe sharing problems or struggles they're going through, can I pray for you? That's all. It lets them know this. You count yourself chosen of God. You want to pray to this God for them. That's a priestly function. 
you know a nation where their cares can be petitioned for to the king. You're the king's son or daughter, and so you're his. And lastly, by virtue of bringing God into the equation, that's your preaching. You're saying to that person who doesn't know God, hey, God knows you and God cares for you. Can I bring your need to him? In the Christian community, everyone's called to be preachers. And one of the way, the biggest ways we preach is through this, light bearers. That's the last part of Peter's sentence here. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Now, first of all, Peter again seems to be calling to mind more Old Testament passages. Maybe you hear around Christmas time, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned, referring to eventually those outside of the traditionally understood people of God, Gentiles. Like verse 3 says, you have enlarged the nation, the holy nation, and increased its joy. And that's the other side of light I want to explore. Joy. Light in the world. You know, when, when Jesus begins his ministry, he also quotes Isaiah. He gives some really good news, I think. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the, Lord, the year of the Lord's favor. Friends, this is our message. This is the message, we, the light we get to bear, the praises we get to proclaim. This is our identity as a Christian community, a community of Christ. And these five words I started with and brought up to you again, can I pray for you, I believe, really captures everything Peter is saying here. You're accepting the identity and authority granted to you as a chosen, lowercase mediator, part of a set-apart nation. The question comes from the place of a son or daughter of God, and it preaches and gives light. When darkness comes, tragedy, suffering, relational issues, if that's met with, can I pray for you, it's met with light. It's met with hope. It's met with, I believe in prayer. I believe God answers prayer, and I believe there's light at the end of the tunnel with that prayer. Right? Right? So that's my rabbinical, my, my touchstone book, bench, mark, no, bookmark that I hope brings up 1 Peter 2, 9 for you. Can I pray for you? So this is the, my first foray into the community of Christ. As the community of Christ, we are priests for the world. We're chosen by him and in him we're priests for the world. We're set apart as a people. We're a separate nation. We're his. We're preachers and light bearers. The subjects I hope to be covering in the future looking at this topic are ideas of self-denial. What does it mean to join a church or to worship God as a community or to even live together as communities? Just to name a few. But for now, can I pray for you? <laughs> Father, thank you that we're chosen because of who you are. Thank you that, came, that you came and you set out to make a nation, a people for yourself, for your glory. Thank you that we get to bring messages of light and hope into a dark world. Sometimes it's easy to see the world dark when things are dark. And perhaps now is a, a, a ripe time, as it were, to live into this identity you give us as priests for the world. Father, help us to just ask people, whenever we feel you nudge us, can I pray for you? Help us to be priests for the world. Help us to know that, and as we are learning each and every Sunday, it seems like, through prayer time, you answer prayers, you work, you move when we pray. You do things. There is power in prayer. So we pray as we pray every day, hopefully. Please fix our world. And please continue to use us to be your priest for the world. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are the Thank you.